operate within their thinking, within their minds. Children learn by repetition, but adults, we don't learn so much for repetition. We, we, we don't, we're not able to handle that very well, but we are able to handle as we internalize our thinking and express it out loud in words. Here we go. This is today's lesson, how God rescues us. <clears throat> Once dead and deceived by Satan. That's Sunday's part. Monday's part is once deluded by our own, by our own desires. Tuesday, now resurrected, ascended, and exalted with Christ. Wednesday, now blessed forever by grace. Thursday, now saved by God. Now notice the contrast between the two, first two and the last three. The first two is once. Once something happened, but then something else developed, right? So God intervened. On number three, now God, you're going to see in the text, but now God, two great huge words. So these are the, this is the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, right here. And I chose a text to highlight that particular topic. Once dead and deceived by Satan, based on Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Let's go to Monday. Once deluded by our own desires, based on Ephesians 2.3, all of us also lived at one time gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Go to Monday, uh, Tuesday. Now resurrected, ascended, and exalted with Christ. Ephesians 2 6. He raised us up together. He made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wednesday. Now blessed forever by grace. Ephesians 2 7 that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Last day, Thursday, this is a huge text that we quote all the time and is so consequential for our lives. And it comes from Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. <coughs> Excuse me. For by grace... You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we, as, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. I have questions for you today. So, <clears throat> we're going to read a passage in a few minutes that summarizes the lesson. And it's the first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. That's the whole lesson. So if you haven't studied the lesson, read right now Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read it together. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, that's the lesson for today. So, in Ephesians, Paul challenges us to, number one, live close to Christ. What does that mean? You think about that. To function as the living body of Christ on earth. By being here, you are functioning as the living body of Christ on earth. By being in church. The curse of sin and the bondage of sin. He highlights that in Ephesians 2. 
the effect that the curse of sin and the bondage of sin has in our lives and how God changes that dynamic into <coughs> a dynamic of salvation. And then Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10, it's how he offers us freedom from all of that. <clears throat> Here's the living body of Christ. It functions together in unity. We function together in unity as a church, as a body. And it is a fruit of faith. That functioning together is a fruit of faith. The church is the living body of Christ made alive by the Spirit of God. That comes from Ezekiel 37. <laughs> made alive by the Spirit of God. <clears throat> I'm going to ask my friend uh, Wayne to read for us out loud the first three verses of Ephesians 2, which is brown in the text there. If you can follow it, it'll be brown. That, he's going to read the that portion, okay. Wayne, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, go. Okay. Let me hear your beautiful voice. Thank you. Hello. world, ascending, ascending, in the, uh, ascending to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, and who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Thank you. Thank you. That's good enough. So, this is Paul at his best. This is Apostle Paul at his best. It would behoove us to dwell in this reading individually and seek, seek the message contained therein. He made... You he made alive, me he made alive, who was dead. I wasn't physically dead, but I was spiritually dead. In trespasses and sins. And then he goes on to say, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. I was a son of disobedience. Through Christ... We are not able to be obedient because it's a gift. Obedience is a gift. Don't think that you generate obedience. We do not generate obedience. Obedient, obedience is a gift of the Spirit. And we were by nature children of wrath. That's our nature. We're going to dwell a little bit on that today. Okay? Our, nature, our nature is our nature, and we can't deny it. We're human. But we have the ability to, to live a life that's different from this world because of what God generates in our hearts and in our minds with the power that he has. Now, we're going to move on to verses 4 to 10 now. And my brother Matt is going to help us out. Matt, would you please read uh, Ephesians 2 from, uh, and notice the first two words. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
that we should walk in them. Again, this is Paul at his best, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, and thank you, Matt, thank you, Wayne, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Number, verse 6, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So how are we saved? With what we do, our efforts, our works? No. We're only saved by grace through faith. And those are gifts. Those are free gifts from God. It is the gift of God, salvation, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're going to explore that a little later, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Wow. Wow. That's my response to that, because this is the gospel right there. In 10 verses, you have the gospel of Jesus Christ with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Do you see all three of them there? All three of them are there, working together. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Read it carefully. The gospel right there in 10 verses. Ephesians 2. There we go. Now, I'm going to open this up a little bit right now for three or four minutes. According to Paul, what has God done for us in Ephesians, say in few words, in a few words, Ephesians 2, 1, 10, what we just read, what has God done for us? Briefly, be brief. Elder Elmer. Yes, uh, for one thing, he said, we are alive in Christ, okay? So we were dead. Now we are alive in Christ. Okay, and that phrase, in Christ, is so important. And uh, you might want to ask later on, what does that mean? Or how do you accomplish that? How do you get in Christ or with Christ? But uh, anyway, the fact is, he made us alive with Christ. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Anybody else? Wayne? It is, it's uh, through God who is rich in his mercy. Absolutely. Through him. Through him. No other power. Absolutely. He has total power. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Wayne, uh, Matt. He accomplished everything that's required for us. Thank you. That's our, beautiful. Our only, the only thing he needs us to do is to choose it. Respond. Yep. Amen. Thank you for your brief words. He's done everything he needs to do. Anybody else before we move on? Uh, yes, Roger. God holds no grudges. Holds no grudges. A God of love. No God grudges. of love. Okay, thank he you. No evil, but his love is 100%. 100%. You see that like a human being, you, you love and then you hate. You love. No, God, God's love is 100%, period. Never changes. He has no evil thoughts. Never changes. Do you know that we have Wednesday prayer meeting here and Wednesdays at 7 p.m.? Roger is always there. He's a champion of prayer. I like hearing the word of God. To me. He's made provision for us. He's made provision for everything. 
because Paul even says later, he said, he's giving us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We have no excuse. No excuse. It's easier to be saved than to be lost, isn't it? Okay, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. Thank you so much. God has done everything. God made us alive together with Christ from being dead in trespasses and sin, and God raised us up together. And God made us sit together, and God showed the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. How is that accomplished? How is what accomplished? Salvation? Uh, uh, seated with him. Okay. Uh, in, uh, uh, it's coming. Him. Oh, oh. It's coming. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So now the, we can discuss briefly the topic of uh, our own engagement in our church participation. And this could be a reflective question for you. You can respond if you want to, but think about this. Do you see yourselves as active, engaged members of God's church? Remember the body of Christ. The body of Christ comes together and it functions. It's like the blood. The blood gives life to the body. Without the blood, without our blood, we couldn't live. But it goes around the body, keeping our systems and our functions working. Same thing with the church. Do you see yourselves as being active and engaged in church? Do we lack something in that regard? And if so, why? Something to think about this morning, okay? See if we can move on. Some of these slides are going to go by fast. Okay. There we go. Once dead and deceived by Satan. This is Sunday's lesson. Paul contrasts here our past sinful experience with the blessing of God's salvation. We participate in Christ's resurrection, ascension, and exaltation. And Elmer was referring to exaltation a few minutes ago. Or hopefully we'll look into that a little bit. Paul celebrates the basis of our salvation by grace only. By grace. It's a gift. Paul identifies two external forces that dominate our prior experience and our present experience if we are not focused on Christ Jesus. And I find myself being distracted when my mind is not in Christ. Number one is the course of this world, the customs and the behaviors in society. We have to watch out for that because that influences who we are or who we become. And then number two, Satan himself. We already know that. But Satan uses the world to change our perceptions of reality. And our reality is Christ, but if we don't have Christ as our reality, then our reality becomes what we see every day in this world. What does Ephesians 2 teach about the reality of the great controversy between good and evil? I'm going to throw out that question again. Brief answers. Can we draw comfort and hope in the knowledge that Jesus has been victorious? And if so, how? Can we share in Jesus' victory now? Take one of those and just tell us what you think briefly. What does Ephesians 2 teach us about the reality of the great controversy between good and evil? Anybody? Remember, the, the controversy, the great controversy is created by Satan because he challenged God. So there's a constant fight going on in the universe, in the earth, between good and evil. How do you see that in Ephesians 2? Mary. I just have to remember what Paul was saying. He goes, when I want to do good, I don't. And when, you know, it's, it's like a controversy back and forth. He wants to do good in his heart, but he winds up doing the wrong thing. And then so we have an excuse to do wrong? No, 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 no. Okay. He, said, he said, 
you know, it said, wicked man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? And he said, thank God, Christ will, you know. Mm -hmm. but, and he's also saying, it doesn't mean you can go out and break the law. You know. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? How does the great controversy, how is the God controversy reflected in Ephesians 2? Anybody? Brief. But sister here, uh, Matt, there's a sister right there. Thank you. But for you to do good, you need to follow Christ, what she said, because the gospel has an order. But for you to do evil, you follow the evil, you follow Satan. Okay. You cannot do both at the same time. Okay, so that's the great controversy right there. Do good, follow God. Do bad, you're following Satan, basically, right? Anybody else, briefly? And yes, that's, that's, that's Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 2, you see an equation, an equation that starts with us being in trouble, in sin. And then God intervenes, and He changes that into a positive dynamic. He gives us everything that we need to obey Him and to find salvation. So there's the great controversy right there in, in 10 verses. And my wife wants to say something. Please do. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our lesson, uh, lesson today points out that we were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in sins, in our sins. But God, by His grace, He alone has quickened us. You know, when we are in sin, we enjoy sin. We love doing sin, and we don't even know that we are doing sin. But then, God, in His great mercy, He quickened us, and that is His grace. And now back to the question. The question is, I mean, uh, my, the point that I'm bringing is that there are two things, basically, that we wrestle against. First is our fallen nature. We have that desire to sin, but thank God in His mercy, He gives us that overcoming power through the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, there is the devil, who apart from our fallen nature and our sinful desires, also, if we don't cling to Jesus, He is the one who, he who really loves us to fall. So, uh, our lesson today, gives us hope that in Christ, although we have that fallen nature, although Satan has all the powers and principalities that he has, we can be victorious in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next one. Mary, you want to say something quick? Or Elmer? Yes. Uh, but go ahead. Uh, the, uh, how You asked the question, you know, what does, if Christ has been victorious already, does that play a role in, in our situation? Yes. Absolutely. Amen. And, I can tell, and I'll tell you why. Jesus has already saved us. Jesus has already died in the cross for us. Jesus has already ascended to heaven for us. He already has sat down in the, in, beside Christ, beside God in the heaven for us. And he has done that. You know, when he... he he died on Calvary. He said he was thinking of you and I already, okay? But it becomes a reality and experience for us as we accept that. So there, there are two parts of salvation, essentially, in my thinking. One is what God has done, and the other, the other part of it is our acceptance and believing, you know, whoever believes will. Uh, have everlasting life. Yes. So acceptance, believing, and obeying. Let me just, uh, you made a point about obeying. Yes, uh, we may not have the power to obey, but God gives us the power to obey. But we have to want to obey. And the Holy Spirit will guide us into that, into that uh, attitude of wanting to obey. Uh, but, and we can obey uh, with, with God's power, which already we have talked about last week, you know, how powerful is God. Thank you, Elmer. Thank you for addressing that, that second question there. So, yes, we can draw hope and comfort 
from the fact that Jesus obtained a victory already. And we can, can we do that now? Yes, we can do that now through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Christ came to show, that it is possible to obey the law. Anyway, Mary, real quick. and Oh, Jumi, okay, Jumi, I'm coming to you. Mary, go, Mary, go ahead. Really quick, really quick. If, if anybody has their Bibles and can turn to Ephesians 2, 13, it's absolutely beautiful what is in here. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were so far away through and by and in the blood of Christ have been brought near. For he is himself, our peace, our bond of unity and harmony. He has made us both Jew and Gentile, one body, and has broken down, destroyed, abolished the hostile dividing wall between us. And 15, by abolishing in his own crucified flesh the enmity caused by the law with its decrees and ordinances, which he annulled, that he from the two might create in himself one new man, so making peace, and he designed to reconcile to God both in a single body by means of his cross, thereby killing the mutual em enmity and bringing the end to an end. So Mary, how would you summarize in five words what you just said? Well, it is, yeah, because of what he's done. It's because of what he's done, not what we've done because of what he's done. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Because of what he has done. But God. Okay, again, but God. Okay, Jumi, Jumi. So I was going to draw out um, the, how Ephesians chapter 2 shows us the reality of great controversy. It's the battle between evil and good. And, and Ephesians chapter 2 said that once we were dead and doomed forever because of our sins, and we lived like the rest of the world, and we were obeying Satan. But what did God do? Just because he was, is full of mercy, and he loved us so very much, while we were dead, he chose to die for our sins. He, he chose to set us free, because the ransom for our sin, for the ransom for our lives, was so much. But God, they said, he did not spare his only son. He gave him up to die for us on the cross. And he said, why will he not also freely give us all things through him? So even till now, that victory that Paul tells us, he has died once and for all, it's once. Mm -hmm. So that death of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago is paying for my sin today and for tomorrow. So the great controversy is settled. Because Christ settled the great controversy, and God settled the great controversy in the gift that he gave us of his son on the cross by the blood. The great controversy is settled, and it will be materialized after Christ's second coming. And we are privileged as a movement, as the Seventh-day Adventist movement in the world, to believe the doctrine of the sanctuary and the doctrine of Christ's second coming and the doctrine of the millennium and the judgment that's to come of the, of the wicked. Because though we are judged, we are protected and covered by our supreme lawyer, advocate, which is Jesus Christ. So our salvation is assured. So the great controversy is settled. Elmer. Yes. Uh the great controversy is settled from, from God's point of view, though. But as I, 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 I was ex expressing, just like any gift, you don't get the gift until you receive it, okay? God is giving us the gift of life, eternal life, and everything that we have uh, talked about here. But until we receive it and believe it and know it, that God is so good that he has done this already, for, I don't know anybody who would not accept that gift Okay, so, but we have to accept that gift uh, and, and receive, and by accept it, there's a, a comment here, uh, how do we do good? How do we do good? Accept that gift and know what God has done. And in response to what God has done, then we will be able to do that good because he, as, as you already said, one of the things that he has done, he has 
created us to do good works. God has already made us to do good works, okay? So it doesn't even have to emanate from us, but from what God has done, what God has done already previously, even before the foundation of the world. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. So, yes, the great controversy is settled, but it will materialize in the future, right? When the whole universe will see what the character of God is in light of the history of this world and the end of the history of this world with the ending of evil, because Satan will be destroyed ultimately according to Revelation. So that will settle the, the, for, for good for the whole universe, the great controversy. Uh, I did have a quote in here, and I might have missed it, but let me advance this to the next one. Do you want to say something? Okay, my wife wants to say something. Go ahead. Um, it is important to note that our, our lesson and our Bible points out that God has already predestined us to be saved. From the foundation of the world, he already meant that all of us will be saved. Of course, we have our choice. But it is uh, an important truth to realize that whatever struggle I am or we are undergoing right now, God has already predestined you to be saved in his kingdom. So hang on to Jesus, cling to Jesus, because whatever struggles you have right now, the power that is available to us is more than our desires, more, more than our fallen nature, more than the power of Satan. And also our lesson points out that because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, with that, we are also said to be co-resurrected with him. We are also co-raised with him, and we are also co-seated with him. And that is really a very marvelous uh, Bible truth. Also, I'd like, I'd like to point out here in our lesson, because of what Jesus has done for us in the past, and what, for what he is doing for us in the present, in the future, I, and it, this really struck me. It's found in page 48 of our lesson, and it says here, in the coming ages, God looks forward to demonstrating the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So if you have experienced God's love and forgiveness to you, if you have for, experienced the, the, the power that is available to you through Christ Jesus, it's the same kindness, it's the same grace, and it's the same uh, kind of experience that God would want us to experience in the future when we are with him in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. We experience the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God right now, but isn't it an amazing thought to think that even when we are in heaven, we will still experience the same kindness and goodness of God for us. Just, just a comment, just to add to what, what Lucy said. We will never graduate from the grace of God. <laughs> Amen. Because that's eternal. The grace of God is eternal. By the way, I want everybody to be part of this conversation. So feel free to make comments as you, as you see them fit. After Roger. Re after reading my Bible, I realized that my purpose here in this world is to, to, serve, Je to serve Jesus Christ. And he said, love not the world, neither the things of this world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in Serve Jesus Christ. Thank you. Anybody else? One more there, and then we're going to move on. We're not making progress in the terms of the lesson, but go ahead. Yes, my sister, you talk about the struggle. We don't have any struggle yet. We're going to have a struggle. You know, it's, it's not even a start. We're going to have a struggle if we don't. We're going to have? Struggle. What she said. Yes. Struggles. Yeah. We're going to have struggles, okay? We're going to have it. We don't have it yet. If we don't follow what Jesus said, I said already the gospel has an order. The gospel have an have a order because Jesus, when Jesus left the departure from the disciples, the disciples keep the gospel. They push it. For us today, we have a gospel for today. Because at every time, 
God bring a message for the time where the people on earth they, they judge by the gospel. If you accept the gospel, you move forward. If you don't accept it, you stay behind. Thank you, Dr. Sister. Thank you. Let's look at uh, nine points that are uh, consequential from Ephesians 2, first 10 verses. Apart from, God, from the intervention of God, human existence is dominated by external and internal forces. Number two, the present reality of a lost life is distressing, but the last day implications of a lost life are more frightening. So we have to make a decision whether we want to or not, because a lot is at stake. We have come to understand that there is something deeply wrong with us, hopefully, at this point. Number four, living the Christian life is not just a matter of conquering a bad habit or two, or overcoming current sins. Let's continue and let's see what it says. Five, we do not just contend with sins. So this is the consequence of number four. We started this on number four. I'm not going to go back because of the traffic, traffic moving back and forth. We do not just contend with sins. We contend with sin. So what is the difference between sin and sins? If we are in sin, we are open to sins. Sins are individual acts that happen in our lives. But sin is a, is a state. Sin is a state. It's where we are. So we are either in sin or in Christ. So it's beyond sins. The problem is not just sins. We have sins because we are in sin. And that's the human nature. Let's move on. We are bent to our rebellion against God and towards self-destruction. And that's the world. The world today is bent toward rebellion against godly principles, and you see it in everyday life, and toward self-destruction. Humans are caught in a pattern of self-destructive sinful behavior. We already did this, following the dictates of Satan and our own innate sinful detail, uh, desires. Paul warns us that sinful acts rooted in a sinful nature, remain a threat for Christians. So these are critical points. And positively, the old self need no longer dominate the believer who through the power of Christ can put off the old self and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness. In the true righteousness and holiness. We're going to move on. How corrupted, you know what, let's move on. We already de dealt with this. This is still dealing with the first three verses. We're going to move on. Question here, we're not going to address it. How corrupted is sin sin human nature even after we have given ourselves to Jesus? We have to be aware of the fact that our, our nature, it's still under the influence of corruption, but Christ changes that dynamic completely, okay? We're not going to deal with that. What should human corruption teach us about how important it is to cling to Jesus every moment of our lives? <coughs> That's one of the keys right there, or the key. The only way is to cling to Jesus. Okay, we're going to move on to the resurrected, ascended, and exalted with Christ. Two powerful wor words, as Matt read, but God. Paul pivots from our past lives to the new life. He changes the dynamic of that conversation in the, in the first 10 verses of Ephesians uh, chapter 2. To new life realities that characterize our lives as believers. <coughs> Here we go. But God, the words that we said before, okay? But God. Now by faith resurrected, ascended, and exalted with Christ. Stunning truth. There they are. Three important salvation history christ center events. Number one, resurrection. Number two, ascension. And number three, exaltation. Okay? Now, we will go through those experiences after our death. 
But spiritually, in our present lives, we can also go through those three dynamics on earth. Okay, we're going to look into that. So verse 5 and verse 6, we already read them. We're going to move on. But even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. There's the resurrection right there. You see that? When it says, made us alive together with Christ is the resurrection. That's a reference to baptism. When you are baptized, you're resurrected to a new life. So there's the resurrection that takes place here on earth in a Christian. And it's already passed over. Past, if, you, if you're a baptized member, it's in your past. You've already been resurrected in Christ. You will also be we resurrected when Christ comes. If you happen to be resting. If not, you will be transformed immediately, which is equivalent to a, re a resurrection, because your life will be totally changed instantly. And raised up to get, raise us up together. That's ascension. Ascension, we ascend. Raised us up together, okay? That's number two, ascension. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow. And that is to be exalted. Can you believe the exaltation of being sitting next to Christ? And there is a quote that's coming up, if I'm not mistaken. It was there before. I want to read it to you because it's amazing. <clears throat> we already discovered, discussed this a little bit. I'm not sure we want to dwell on it. But how do we as righteous believers participate in Christ's resurrection? ascension and exaltation. And when does this participation occur? Ephesians 2, 6 and 7 says, but God in the ages to come, okay? It happens in our present experience as Christians, but it also happen in the ages to come, meaning after Christ's return. Let's move on. So we see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, as righteous believers, we are co-resurrected with Christ. Co-resurrected, co -resurrected meaning collaboratively, together, together. We are resurrected with Christ. We are co-raised with Christ. Co-seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Meaning that believers participate in Christ sitting on the heavenly throne. And we are co-exalted with Jesus by being co-seated with him. This really is a long Bible story, but we don't have time for that. But the power of the word of God is limitless. When you submit yourself to the reading of the word of God, it changes you. We can talk, but talking only reaches a certain level of intensity and attention but when you submerge yourself individually in your desk at home, in your table, in your study, and you read the Word of God, it changes you in a very direct, personal way. What are the essential elements and goals of God's plan of salvation? There are three there. Let me see here. You see right there you have... <clears throat> blessed with every spiritual blessing. So that's an essential element of God's plan of salvation, that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. We have no excuse. Like Jumi said earlier, we have no excuse. Elmer, my wife, the points they made, is God has done everything possible to save us. All that spending is our response. How are we going to respond to God's action? It requires our response. And that's our challenge in this present time in history because the world is out there. They are absorbed in their ways. And we have the opportunity somehow to witness to them. And the lesson later on talks about good works. What is the purpose of good works in the life of a Christian? Well, I submit to you <coughs> that the purpose of good works in the life of a Christian is to glorify, glorify God, is to vindicate his character. That's the purpose of good works, not of ourselves. And they're not our works. They're Christ's works. 
And it's beautiful when you realize that it's Christ in you, in your thinking and in your heart, that does the action. It's not you doing the action, it's Him doing it through you. When you allow Christ to work through you, then it's all about Him. It's all to His credit. I'm just a vessel being transformed of through, who he, through whom the Spirit works. It's a dynamic that is free-flowing, it's creative, it's energized, it's powerful, and you can't resist it. The world needs to see the good works of the people of God somehow. Let's move on. I uh, number the point right there. He chose us that we should be holy without blame. Wow. You see what he does? What he does, he reaches us with such spiritual blessings, all of them, that he makes us holy without blame. In his mind, in his eyes, we are holy. We see ourselves like, wow, look at this guy. He made a mistake. You know, we focus on the negative always. When you're driving, oh, this guy pulled ahead of me or whatever. God doesn't look at us that way. He, his vision of us is totally changed and transformed. Paul. And finally, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Another dynamic in salvation right there. Essential element of planned salvation, God's riches of his grace, the riches of his grace. Okay, so synthesized uh, in a few words. We're all, we always need grace. God's plan ha stretches forever into the future, all the coming ages. God's plan for the eternal future is founded on the same principle of grace as his actions in the past and present. God's plan is always finding grace, founded in grace. Ephesians 2, 7, in the coming ages, God looks forward to demonstrating the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Wow. Now, that is, again, if you take this verse, it's so rich, it's so penetrating, and so revealing about what God does through immeasurable reaches of his grace. You cannot even measure the richness of God's grace. We're, we're conditioned to calculate numbers and think about amounts. You cannot quantify grace. Grace is unquantifiable. Grace is limitless, um, immeasurable riches of his grace, and kindness towards us. The bottom, God's grace is a treasure from which we may draw any time, and grace exhibits the grand generosity <coughs> of God towards us. Let's see where we are. 54, we got six minutes. Oh, here, here's, the, here's the what I wanted to read you. Listen to this now. This comes from the side of ages, pages 19 and 20, okay? By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to man and to angels. You know that? Jesus came to reveal God, God's character. To angels, good and bad, even the falling angels, the one-third of the angels that followed Satan. But not alone for his earth-born children was his revelation given. Listen to this now. Not alone for his earth-born children was this revelation given of Jesus Christ. That's us, right? We are we are earthborn. Our little world, listen to this sentence now. Our little world, the earth, is the lesson book of the universe. Wow. Do you know that there is a universe out there? We are unable to understand the extent of it. 
listen to Lou Giglio. Go to your YouTube, look at Lou Giglio. It's a youth pastor describing the cosmos. And you will see there is, it's, it's, it's immeasurable. We cannot understand. And yet there are worlds out there that were created, we know from the spirit of prophecy, Ellen G. White talks about this. There are worlds that are out there that are unfallen. We are the only planet that's fallen. <clears throat> we are the attention of the universe. We are a spectacle, we are a theater, and the universe is watching what's happening in the earth right now. Other beings are watching what's happening. And we will be an example, and we will have the opportunity to vindicate. Talk about the great controversy. We will have an opportunity to vindicate the character of God. Christ makes that possible. I think they're telling us to, okay. Oh, oh, you know what? There's so much coming. I am sorry. Okay, so let's finish this. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of receiving, redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, and it will, it will be their study throughout endless ages. Talk about eternity. The theme of God's plan is His grace, and it will be a subject to study throughout endless ages, even by angels. Imagine for us, both the redeemed and the unfallen beings, we are the redeemed, you are redeemed, but there's other unfallen beings that are live in other, not just planets, yes, planets, anyway, we're not gonna go there, but both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. Wow. That is the sire of ages. Go to it. Pages 19 and 20. Ellen G. White. Uh, okay, so our time is over. Uh, we got two minutes. Um, Again, by God's loving favor, you have been saved from the punishment of sin through faith. It is not anything you have done. It is not given to you because you work for it. It is a gift of God. If you could work for your salvation, <coughs> you would be proud. I'm glad, I'm glad that I don't have to work for my salvation. I'm glad I don't have to take pride. I'm glad I can surrender. I can give God all the credit for everything that happens in my life and my future. And our future is safe in here, in him. You can be confident, you can trust him because he never fails. He is eternal, he doesn't change, and he's perfect in love. And he's done everything possible to make sure you're gonna be in the new earth after the millennium. So, we're gonna close now. Uh, I'll pray, and then we'll collect the, uh, the offering for Sabbath School for the support of the, this work. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we are so insufficient and so, so little, and you are so big, so eternal, so complete, so perfect, and we don't understand some of these things. We hope that someday we will be able to understand a little better but we are in awe because of what you have done, the opportunities that you give us, the salvation that you give us in Jesus Christ. We're thankful for making it all possible because it is impossible for us as human beings. But you are able to perform the miracle in our hearts of transforming us into what we are not and transforming us into 
a reflection of the life of Jesus, and we praise you for that. We thank you for saving us, and we thank you for coming soon. We look forward to your second coming, Lord Jesus, and we pray that your church will be faithful to you, and you will be vindicated in the universe, so the world, the universe can see that you are a righteous God that's perfect, loving, full in grace, and eternal. And now be with us as we dismiss, and thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. series of passages of scripture that will encourage you, strengthen you, and make you fearless. Are you ready? Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Psalm 16, 7 through 8. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I've set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Psalm 4, verse 8. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you, O oh Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there's any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Psalm 138, verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. Psalm 138, verse 8. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O oh Lord, is everlasting. Psalm 138.3 On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. Philippians 4, verse 19 my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 41, verse 10. 
Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you with my righteous right hand. And then there's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He will keep you, and he will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Isaiah 54, 17. Watch this carefully. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Psalm 32, verse 7. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. In Psalm 94, verse 19, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. And Psalm 23, verse 4, Even though I walk through the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Read these verses daily. They'll become a shield to your thinking and your emotions. We're in a spiritual war. And I've given you the spiritual ammunition you need for spiritual victory every day. You will find yourself becoming stronger more bold and courageous in your daily walk with the Lord. Remember, you're living by the Word of God, not by what other people are saying or whatever they may be doing or what they believe. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, 
and he will direct your path. We are trusting you. You said your word will not return a void. May the fruit of Scripture, the fruit of the Word of God, surround, uphold, overshadow every person who has heard these verses. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome as well. Thank you so much for joining us. And, you know, I just came from vacation. Thanks, God. And I miss all of you. And you know what? Let's just say hello to each, of, to each uh, one as a church family. Let's just uh, take one minute and say hello to the person who is next to you. Okay? And family, I have uh, friends and, and family here who came to visit us. Uh, we have the Brisees. We wanted to welcome you from the bottom of our heart. We have uh, Misty Galicia. Do you know Misty Galicia? Yes, uh, we wanted to welcome her and her family. We have the Ryans here, Dick and Joan Ryan. We wanted to welcome you. You know, that this is like a beautiful combo there with Tierra also. Thank you so much for coming and visit uh, your church family here, also in Mountain View. And I don't know if I, we have any other uh, person, but uh, please feel welcome. This is your church family. I know that uh, among us is there other people who are uh, here. You know, we have Joy, but Joy is in the sound booth. Are you going to be preaching, sa uh are you going to be preaching, Joy? Oh, no. She's there. like a, She's like doing something. 
anyway, we wanted to welcome you uh, as well. Thank you so much. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, the first one is we wanted to do a professional face for Valencia Teveni. Uh, Val uh, Valencia is here. Valencia. Valencia, come in, please. You just uh, give her a hand, you know. We wanted to accept her for my professional faith today. Valencia, thank you so much for, for choosing Mountain View as a church family. Here is your church family. And we wanted to officially give you the welcome to this place. I hope and we pray, I am, that here you will find uh, Jesus. You will find uh, a family who will support you. And you will find a place that always is a place of welcome, um, everyone, including you and your family, okay? So on behalf of the church, we wanted to give you this certificate as a family, and we wanted to pray for you, just, short, uh, just a short prayer for uh, Father in heaven, we come to you this morning praising and honoring you. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege and this honor you give us of being part of this beautiful, beautiful army that you have set up in these last days. I thank you, Lord, for this young lady, that she has been accepted by faith. Be with her, Lord. Let her be involved in your work here in this church. Not be a stranger, because when your people come together, we're not strangers. We all come together in one accord to love you and to serve you. In Jesus we have. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> then I have, uh, don't forget that after our church service today, we have the uh, farewell luncheon for Pastor Melody. It's going to be right here in, uh, in our academy. That will be after, right after our church. And tomorrow at 3 p.m., we have uh, the memorial service for Miguel Rivera, 3 p.m. Um, are we, the, are we are gonna, uh, I have a couple well. announcements. Right. So uh, stay uh, with uh, me there, okay? Church, church, church. Sorry, sorry, we're gonna be Ma many stuff. Um, on Monday, uh, July 24, we have the Lifeline screening. This is like a kind of a, a medical clinic uh, uh, that happens here. Always, um, there's going to be from 8 to 5. Uh, they provide different services, and whoever is interested on participating on the lifeline screening, you can get some more information at the foyer. Also, the Woman Ministry uh, fundraiser will be happening in August 13, and if you want some more information, Diane Radcliffe, who is the woman ministry director? Uh, Diane is around? Yes, Diane. Oh, the foyer, also in the foyer. You can reach out to her. And then, uh, Jerry, you have some announcement. Yes, our youth director. Um, I just want to uh, share with you guys Thursday night. Thursday nights. We have an ongoing Bible study training class for our youth, our collegiates, and our young adults. It's 13 to 18 for the youth, and then the collegiates and the young adults. And it's ongoing until October 26th, and it's going to culminate in a weekend of prayer on the 27th and 28th. And this is not just our youth, but this is valley-wide. It's a Nevada-Utah conference event. Um, so what encourage all of our young people and our collegiates and our young adults to attend is here at this church 7 30 to 8 30 or 7 to 8 30 and we've been getting out right at 8 30 so it's not gonna like overflow or anything like that um, and next weekend next sabbath which is our fifth sabbath there is going to be a lunch study group meeting in the multi-purpose room with pastor neary from uh, the paradise seventh-day adventist church and it will last approximately two hours and will be well worth your time. So I urge you to come next Sabbath and every Thursday if you can. Uh, you will be blessed. And I want to make one quick impromptu. 
I just found out some really good news this week, this Sabbath in Sabbath school. One of my young kids has been baptized. Amen. Abby Luong. And God, <laughs> and God smiled. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you so much. The Pathfinders and the Adventures will resume their meetings on the month of August. So for any information, contact you get Jean, who is the uh, adventure uh, director, and uh, Judith Gallet, uh, who is the Pathfinders director. Here now, the last announcement, the last announcement we have with uh, um, our elder, uh, Rudy. Thank you. So next week, Sabbath, be here at 10 o'clock in the morning. You have an appointment. You know that? Sabbath school. I want to see the church full. Sabbath school. Amen. Let's do it, okay? Next week, we're studying horizontal atonement. You know what horizontal atonement is? Mm. This vertical atonement. Mm. Vertical atonement is the removal of... Uh, the effects of sin between us and God. God removes the effects of sin because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a vertical dynamic from here on high. There's a horizontal dynamic, which is the topic next week. It has to do with the removal or the reconciliation of any difference between any group in, in, in the world. So in other words, Gentiles and Jews, there's no difference. God wants us to remove any difference between us. He wants us to work together in unity, in love, in peace, based in his character of love. So we're going to study that next week. On Tuesday, Paul points out that when we, and this, I finish with this, when we use the Word of God as a wedge to divide, mm. you know what that is to God? That is anathema to God. You know what anathema is? Anathema is abomination, is something offensive to God, because that's not the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is not to divide, it's to bring together. So don't ever use the law of God to divide you from other people. Seek union instead of division. That's the topic for next week. So be here at 10 o'clock next Sabbath. Bring a friend. And let's have a wonderful Without my chest. Keep spiritual going. time together. God bless you. Thank you, Pathfinders. They will have a in the foyer uh, table registration, and this is the last announcement. Thank you so much for praying, being patient with me. Are we, re are we ready for uh, worship? Church family, good morning, brothers and sisters in Jesus, fellow travelers on the road to eternity. Happy, happy Sabbath to all of you. Maligayang Sabado. It's always a privilege and a pleasure to be worshiping with you on Sabbath. Let's start our praise service by uh, reading the Word of God. Brother Eric will lead us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Perfecto. What a privilege to, one of, to come together today and, uh, can just tune in today. <laughs> and to receive the <laughs> Word of God. Okay. Uh, it's it's one of the reasons yeah, you can't drive with them. is no. to hear the word of God proclaimed and to share it. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Revelation. What book did I say? Revelation. Chapter 4. What chapter? Four. Revelation chapter 4. We'll be reading uh, verses 8 and uh, verse 11, a portion of those. Uh, I invite you to stand with the congregation at this time, and we're going to read together these uh, powerful verses of the scripture. And they, this is what they said. 
Well, let's all read together. Holy, 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 holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, you are worthy, O oh Lord, to receive glory and power. You created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his holy word. Please keep standing. We are worshiping our Jesus Lord, the King of all kings. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let's sing that song. One, two, three. Church, could y'all join me, please, in inviting the Holy Spirit into our sanctuary? Please bow your head. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we're here today. Father, we're thankful that the AC works in church. And Father, we're thankful that we are able to just congregate together and praise your name. Father, we ask that your spirit be with us. Give us the peace that surpasses understanding and just bring us closer to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. 
That is the title of our next song. Lord, we want to lift your name on high. And oh Lord, we want to thank you for the work you've done in our lives. And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone are God eternal throughout heaven and earth. Earth and heaven above. This beautiful words give us a glimpse of who God is and who we are to him. Let's sing our next song. God is good all the time. Amen. I'm reading uh, First uh, Timothy 6, verse 6 and 7. It says, Now godliness with great, uh, with content is the great again. Verse 7 says, Be 
So yeah, every time I come up here, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> it says, verse 7 say, we brought nothing into this world, and it is a certain we can carry nothing out. It is a blessing we be here for everything is going out. The heat, we sit in here in very comfortable um, century, and, and uh, we all here. Everything belongs to God, including us. God is our creator. So the only thing he wants us to do, to be obedient to him. So Dickens, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with grateful heart to say thank you. We thank you for loving us so much. We thank you for providing for us. Thank you, Father, for keeping us safe and protected. Thank you for shelter. We thank you, Father God, for your son, Jesus. We pray, Father, your spirit, your presence be among us this morning. Bless our service, Father, and receive our offering. Help us, Father, to continue to praise and honor you because you are soon returned. Prepare us for your soon return, Father. We thank you, we praise you, we honor, we worship you. Bless our tie and offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, if you are, if you are asked to define the word gospel, which Bible verse would you use? Bible verse that you would use to define gospel? John 3.16, that's what is in my mind too. But let, if you know it by heart, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know who said those words? Who said those words that we just repeated? It's Jesus himself. Jesus himself. Our next song is about this wonderful gospel. I invite you to do something. Close your eyes very tightly. Close your eyes very tightly. In your mind's eye, imagine God's only begotten Son stepping down from his majestic throne, humbly taking off his robe, his royal robe, and laying down his magnificent crown. His amazing, burning love for you and me led him to die on the cross in yours and my place so we could live with him for eternity. Wow, God. Let's sing our next song. What more would he do?
one of the more endearing qualities of our Mountain View Church is racial diversity. As Sister Dale mentioned last Sabbath, when she was calling for tithes and offerings, there are about 58 nationalities represented in our church. Amen. So, we are a church family with 58 different motherlands. Think about that. But we are all citizens of heaven, Amen. our true homeland. And that is where God is taking us in his, as his children to live with him for eternity. And we are going home soon, very soon. Our next song is entitled, We Are Nearing Home. Nearing home means we're almost home. Mountains is a metaphor for painful trials and tribulations that we encounter as God's children on our journey home. As we sing our next song, freely fill your imagination with visions of that beautiful home God has lovingly prepared for us. We are nearing home.
In a little while, we will be approaching God's throne of grace to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him in prayer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Brother Sebastian will be talking to Jesus in our behalf. What I would like for us to remember is this. Our loving God knows every single one of us here. Every single one of us. He knows in a very personal way. From the youngest baby to the oldest grandparent. He knows us all. He knows us all, and he cares so much. He knows your every thought, your every joy, your every struggle. He hears you when you call. Your loving father knows you by your first name, and he loves you very much. men in a small airport. They're going to the next small city. One was a surgeon. One was a lawyer. One was a freshman college student who was taking a vacation. And the other, a minister. The weather was good. They boarded the plane, taxied, took off, fine takeoff. Just in the middle of the ride, as they were like 20,000 feet up in the air, suddenly turbulence. It was like a roller coaster. And then the pilot opened the door. There was no stewardess. The pilot announced, there are four parachutes. Our engine is not working. He took one of the parachutes, 
opened the door and jumped off. The surgeon stood up. I have surgeries to make. Got a parachute, jumped off. The lawyer stood up. I have cases to handle. Took a parachute, jumped off. The young man and the minister looked at each other. Only one parachute left. Who is going to jump next? The minister looked at the young man and said, You have a bright future. I have served my Lord. Take the parachute. Offered a little prayer. They stood up. And the young man just brightened up. It's a miracle. Yeah, what happened? There are still two parachutes. What happened? The last brilliant man took my backpack. Life is like an airplane ride. Sometimes it's smooth. Sometimes you have air pockets. But then there might be turbulent winds. And we have to jump off into the uncertain future. Will you have a backpack? Or will you have a parachute? Is your backpack your career? Your possessions? Your money, your connections, or is your parachute the everlasting arm of God? Which one do you have? We like to always call on God. We like to pray. And sometimes prayers are answered. Sometimes God does not seem to answer. Do you still have your backpack? Or do you still have your parachute? Can you still trust in God when the weather is rough? When everything is not going your way? And there's no future as if there is no future? We have prayed for some names here. And we have had some good news. Brianna appears to have some blood transfusions ready for her. She's the little girl with the cancer, leukemia. But the good thing with leukemia is in children, the cure rate is very high. But still, there is the uncertainty. But we're glad the prayer has been answered, that there are at least two blood donors. Uh, Cynthia just got out of the ICU. She's in rehab. And we have a brother here also who needs prayer, another one that was named. But I'm sure there are a lot of prayers that need to be answered. But remember, God's everlasting heart, arm is there. And sometimes the future looks bleak. But God has promised, no matter what happens, we have a bright future. All of us have a bright future. Just lean on the everlasting arms. I would like to request those who are willing to uh, kneel down with me. Let's ask God's blessings today. Our Father in heaven, in whom we live and move and have our existence, hallowed be your name. Lord, you have given us so many blessings. Open our eyes that we can see those blessings that we may not see. Lord, we bring you mountain view today. Each one has their own problem. Each one has a praise to say. Lord, all of us have to thank you because Jesus came to guarantee our future. Please forgive us. Please cleanse our, cleanse our unrighteousness and renew a right spirit within us. We pray for healing. Please touch with your healing hand those who need to be healed. Please give us the faith to overcome our uncertainties. We pray for those who need healing with their broken hearts. Relationships that may not be working 
originally it was intended to be. But again, we can always lean on your everlasting arms to give us comfort. We pray for continued blessings in each one. And we pray that you will open our blindness that we can see the world's need. We pray that you can help us see that the face of the person next to us, before we get angry, before we get mad, that that is also a child of God. Lord, we pray that your kingdom will soon come. We pray that each one here, each brother, each sister, each parent, each child, each grandchild, our friends, our neighbors, this whole church can be there with you when you will come and you will say, welcome into my kingdom. Lord, we like to be with you. God with us. And as we rise from our knees, may your, your blessings be upon each one of us. This we ask in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Um, I have a verse, uh, Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. There are many storms going on in all of our lives. Um, and the birthing pains of the earth are getting <laughs> stronger. But it's okay because that means that that the Lord is coming soon. sure by now God you would have reached out and wiped our tears away stepped in and saved the day but once again I say amen and it's still raining and as the thunder rolls I barely hear your whisper through the As your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. Thank you. 
Morning, church. Happy Sabbath. It's good to be home with you for a bit. I've been traveling quite a bit. It's been, I've been spending a couple weeks in Texas, and I'm glad to be home. And I'm very grateful my flight made it in on time last night. Um, and so I'm just very proud and I'm glad to be here this morning. But before we start this morning, I'd like to invite my lovely, beautiful wife to come up this morning. So we just want to um, we just want to praise God and celebrate that uh, this weekend actually marks our one year anniversary from our wedding. But we also have some exciting news to share with all of you. Um, in 20 weeks, um, we will be welcoming our first child into the world. So we're excited and terrified and all of the above at the same time, but we just, um, we've already experienced such an incredible, warm um, love from this community of faith, and I just want to thank you, and um, we also want to ask that you continue to pray for us as we, uh, as we merge or move forward into these waters. So um, thank you so much for coming up, honey. Thank you. <laughs> so we're in a theme of this quarter regarding the topic of community. So all this quarter, we're going to be talking about uh, from the pulpit about community and how, it, how important it is in our church. And I love what Pastor Amos talked about last week, talking about the tenets of community. He dropped some really good stuff talking about the different tenets of community service and how we can integrate that into our church. And he also talked about the biblical tenets of what it means to be a community. Church should be a warm community. And it should be a place where people feel cared about, known, accepted, and more importantly, warmth is deeper than the programs that we do here. It should be a way of life for our church. It should feel more like a family, not, not just on Sabbath, but every day and every moment of every day. This shouldn't be more than just a group of believers that shows up on Sabbath for church. It's a family. So what we're going to talk about today is how we, as the local expression of the body of Christ, can be a warm community. Pastor Angel talked about last week, no, Pastor, Pastor Angel, Pastor Amos, a lot of A's in this pastoral staff, right? <laughs> Pastor Amos talked last week about how we're a global community. We're a global village. And because of technology, we're able to be connected. But we're going to talk about what this local community can do today. So let's pray to start. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for today and for your grace and for what you've done for us. And we, I want to thank you for this community that I can personally testify to, that my family can testify to, the love and the acceptance and belonging that we've experienced here. And I just want to pray, Father God, that today as we break, the, break open the word a little bit and we talk about this, that you can empower us to be a community that is warm and that represents you to the world that we live in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to tell you a story about a boy who grew up in church. He grew up in an SDA home. He got drugged to Sabbath school every week, week after week. He had a big Bible that was bigger than him and a little bow tie that he was dressed up in every Sabbath. And as he grew up, he learned all the truths that a good Adventist parent teaches their kid about the Sabbath and how we don't eat pepperoni and what we're not supposed to do on Sabbath. But as he grew up, as young people do, they get, he got into adolescence, he started to struggle when he started trying to build a faith of his own. 
He intellectually believed the gospel. He intellectually understood what the Advent message is. But he struggled to find a community of belonging, even in the very church he was raised in. What he wrestled with the most was what was presented to him as he grew up. He didn't feel that it was safe to express doubts or ask hard questions. He'd make friends at school that were of other faiths, even within Christianity, but diff- and they differed with him. He would meet people at school who didn't believe in God at all. But he didn't feel like his church was a safe place to express questions or feelings of doubt in his belief in God. And what he found, unfortunately, was, a, was more of an emphasis on behaviors and looking Seventh-day Adventist. And what he remembers throughout his childhood is music wars on styles of worship and drums in church. How to dress. You're not a real Adventist if you're not vegetarian. It's more important to emphasize the different distinct Adventist beliefs that make us different than the rest of Christianity than it is to just share the gospel. That's what he understood was the substance of what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And instead of being mentored in the faith in his growing with Jesus, at times he would encounter belittling instead of mentorship. Especially when he didn't conform to the image of what an SDA should look like. He remembers going to church and singing at another church that he didn't normally go to, and they wouldn't let him on the platform because he didn't have a tie. And then he was led to a closet where they opened it up behind the stage and gave him an ugly tie. And really, this made him question his desire to be an Adventist. Do I want to keep this faith or carry on this faith that my parents are handing down to me? What he really wanted was a community of belonging that would walk beside him, that would journey with him as he was going through this life and walking in the way of Jesus. What he wanted was a place where the conversation was focused on Jesus. Later on in his high school and college years, he heard about a church that was held in a warehouse. And he heard that a lot of young people were going there. So he decided to go and check it out. He was told that he didn't have to wear a suit. He was told that he didn't have to worry about what people would think when he would walk in. But he thought because it was dark and that there were spotlights on the stage that he could slip in and no one would notice. But he found the opposite. Everyone there acknowledged his presence. And almost everybody, it seemed like, in the church walked up to him and said hello and gave him a handshake. Not only was the music of a professional production level, the preaching was rich, it was relevant, it was focused on Jesus. And what made all those things more meaningful was the sense of community that he felt from the first step he took in the door. And they made it a point from the the get-go. You belong here, and we're glad you're here. So before you know it, he made a lot of friends, and he started going to to midweek prayer meetings every week. And it became a place where he felt it was safe to express doubts, to work through tough questions of faith, to deconstruct the unhealthy views of God and beliefs that he had, and reconstruct a healthy balance of understanding in God. And if it wasn't for that place, it's likely he wouldn't be here today. That boy is the man that stands in this pulpit today. When I think about my faith journey and my own struggle to find a place of belonging where I could also believe. I think about all the different Adventist churches I've walked into that mourn the loss of their young people. When I was in school and and getting into my early years of youth ministry, 
a lot of research came out about youth retention and church growth. One of my mentors in the ministry, I didn't get to really know him personally, but I read a lot of his books, was Dr. Bailey Gillespie. And then his son, Tim Gillespie, um, is someone I revere as a ministry mentor. They did the research of the, the value genesis research that took place over 30 years, where they tried to understand where young people are in their, in their faith journey. But more recently, the Fuller Youth Institute conducted a study of 250 churches in the nation, and what they were trying to find is what those churches were doing to effectively engage young people. What they were looking for were churches that were involving and relate, relating to young people and retaining young people, specifically those within the ages of 15 to 29. And what they found was that these churches were employing six essential strategies that help young people love their churches. One of those is what we're going to talk about today, and it's, and it's what we call fueling a warm community. If you're interested in the book, it's Growing Young, produced by Fuller Youth Institute. Now, you might be asking, why does this matter? And you might be also wondering, why is he only talking about young people? And unfortunately, I've walked into churches and we've talked about this, and those who have more years behind them than they do ahead of them felt offended. Saying that, well, why are they only talking about young people? We matter too. You do. And in fact, if you're under 100, you're a young person too. But if we take a moment and we remember why we're here, it's because we're here to preach the gospel and the Advent message and the three angels' messages. So first and foremost, we're here to expand the kingdom of God by making disciples. And in order for us to finish the work, the torch of faith has to be passed down intact from generation to generation. Those of us who have more mature faith, resolute faith, have to take someone under them, as Paul did Timothy, and pass it on. But unfortunately, in our churches, that discipleship pathway has been lost. There's a breakdown, there's a pause, there's a gap that has formed within the generations and when we look at a lot of our churches, Fuller Youth Institute collaborated with the SDA Church, with the North American Division, and what we found was that, unfortunately, our numbers don't differ very much from the rest of Christianity. And they found a very alarming statistic that found that about 50% of, of young people ages 15 to 29 will leave church and faith entirely. Yes, we're, we're Seventh-day Adventists. Yes, we like to preach the remnant message. But we struggle in this area too. They're leaving for a number of reasons. And there's no single one thing that we can do. But if young people are leaving, then who are we going to pass the torch on to? What I want to do is take a look for a moment at the life of Jesus. We're going to look in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to go to verse 41. So we're going to start, and we're going to read through verse 50. I'm reading in the New Living Translation. It says, Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they, were, they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious leaders, listening to them, and asking questions. All who, heard, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. 
But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. What's interesting is this is the only account that we have of Jesus as an adolescent. And what's crazy is in the only account that we have of Jesus as a teenager, his parents lost him. Can you imagine losing Jesus? Joseph, you had one job, and you lost Jesus. You know, I, I'm, I was diagnosed as a young child with ADHD, and I lose things all the time, as my wife will, will tell you. I've forgotten my keys, I've lost my, um, my phone, my all sorts of things, and I have a, a legitimate fear of forgetting my child somewhere. Like, you ever seen those videos of the parents? They get all engrossed and loading all the groceries in their car, the stroller's sitting right there on the sidewalk, and then they get in the car and go. And there's babies sitting there on the sidewalk. That is a legit fear I have, so pray for my child. <laughs> Visiting the temple was obviously important for Jesus to discover what his purpose was. Part of that event was key to Jesus understanding what his mission later on in life would be. But more than likely, Jesus' family was traveling with extended family, as the text says. So if you imagine, they're traveling by mules and by, by donkeys and, and carts in these huge caravans going into Jerusalem for the festivals. And it was very customary that men would travel in one group women would travel in another group, and then the kids would bounce back and forth in between. So it's very likely that the parents just assume that Mary and Joseph assume that, oh, he's with Joseph, or he's with Mary. Three days later, they figure out he's not with either of them, right? And so imagine how Jesus made his parents feel. But the situation begs some questions. Who took care of Jesus? Where did he sleep? Who protected him? Who made sure he was safe? Who fed him? I don't know about you, but I remember when I, when I was a 12-year-old boy, I would get my money's worth at buffets. Right? I went through my, my growth spurt, and I could throw down. We'd try to go like 10 plates for the, for the price of a buffet meal, of a buffet charge, right? Who fed Jesus? The passage implies that others had to care for Jesus. The community had to step in and take care of a boy that they didn't know. And the fact is that Jesus was there for three days. That means somebody had to care for him. Someone took him in. Someone gave him pl a place to sleep. Someone made sure he was safe. And someone fed him and should have left a tab. By the time that his parents got back to Jerusalem, they'd been listening to Jesus for three days. Someone sat and listened to him. What can we say about the experience of our young people in comparison to what Jesus experienced? Do our young people experience today what Jesus experienced then? Our youth, our young adults, new people who come to church, what is their experience? Because sometimes young people feel segregated from the rest of the life of church. They get shoved on their kid's table, they get sent to a Sabbath school room deep in a corner, and they're siloed away from the intergenerational culture or life of the church. There's, an a, there's, a, there's a space, or there's a place for age-specific ministry, but God intends that we grow as a family across the generations. And this is what the research shows us. Young people from ages 15 to 29 are looking for churches to welcome them to the full table. We might assume that young people are looking for a cool church. They're looking for a cool youth pastor with skinny jeans, that, that looks like he, dress, he shops at Urban Outfitters. They want the lights, they want the music, they want the, all the cool things. But what young people really want 
What everyone really wants is an authentic community of belonging. What they want is a warm church. What they want is a church that tells them both in word and in practice, you belong here. And what they want is a church that's willing to accept them where they are and then walk alongside them in their journey into adulthood. Research also shows us that community is often stronger. It's a stronger draw than belief. And I found this in my own life. I knew the Advent message. I knew the distinct beliefs of our faith tradition. And I knew what made us different. And in my heart, there's no way I could ever go anywhere else that doesn't actually cherish the Sabbath. But what I struggled with and what young people are struggling with today is finding community because you have to not only believe, but you must belong. They go hand in hand. So community is often a stronger draw than belief. We as SDAs, we are known for our theology. We're known for our distinct messages. But if we're not a community of belonging, we hinder the ministry effectiveness of our church and we hinder our ability to spread the gospel and share the good news with people. So for young people, deeper relationships is the key to unlocking a life of journey. Because oftentimes, within the church, and I've been to a lot of churches that are, and where there's a lot of well-meaning Adventists, where they want people to look a little bit more like them, to think just a little bit more like them, before they can start to belong to their community. If we want our church to be warm, what we have to focus on is building relationships. What we need to focus on is making people feel like they belong, and then in the context of a relationship, we can help them or we can walk alongside them in their journey of belief. In the research, young people describe the churches that they love the most like family. Speaking truth requires that you have a relationship with somebody. Have you ever received unsolicited advice? How did it make you feel? I'll be frank, I'm Filipino, and something that I get all the time when I go to family gatherings is my aunts and uncles that, they, that think that they have relationship stock with me, but they don't. And then they start to ask at family gatherings intrusive questions about my personal life. They mention things about my weight, whether I lost or I gained. They comment on, you know, where are you in your education or your career? And they start to give give me unsolicited advice that I frankly don't care to take. And they think that just because they're my aunt or my uncle or an elder that They can just say whatever they want. But if I'm being frank, it makes me think twice sometimes about going to certain gatherings. Because I know when I walk in the door, I'm going to be bombarded with questions. Young people, and not even young people, this applies to everybody. Most of us find it extremely off-putting when people who don't who have not put in the time to build relationship with them, try to speak truth into their lives. If you have no relationship, you have no right to speak into them. Your message may be true, but you may not be the right person to relay it to them. A A couple quotes here that I love. One is by Dr. Tim Elmore. It says, we must build bridges of relationship that can bear the weight of truth. Because when you have invested time and stock in building a relationship with someone that you intend to mentor and love, then that relationship can carry the weight of the truth bomb sometimes. The Bible says that we are to hold accountable one another. But if we don't have that relationship stock with them, we cause more harm than we cause good. 
In some chaplaincy training I did, I remember in the corporate chaplains of America, they said our mission statement is to build caring relationships with the hope of building the trust to share, or rather the permission to share the life-changing truth of the gospel. That is the order that we've got to take in building a warm community. You build a relationship, you gain the permission, the consent, and then you can speak truth into people's lives. To be a family, we must belong to each other. We're not just some spiritual individuals who believe alike, and then we collaborate on things once in a while. As believers, we're part of one another. When Paul is talking to the Romans, he uses the analogy of the body of Christ. All of us with our own individual gifts, all of us are part of the same family. When Dr. Palatang hurts, I hurt. Because we're interconnected as the body of Christ. And so the, script, and the scripture suggests that we're adopted into one body, which means we work out what it means to walk in the way of Jesus. The majority of our churches today are growing old and gray, and that is no offense to anybody. I appreciate the wisdom that comes from those who, who come before me. However, there are some churches that are growing young because they're effectively engaging young people and they're engaging their communities, and they're giving them a place at the table. They're building, discipling relationships. The research shows that young people are not only the ones who benefit. Because the, if the whole church focuses on building, discipling relationships, that means that each of us is working on our individual faith formation. We're working on our individual relationships with God so that we have the ability to mentor and pour into each other. If you and I are on our knees and we are asking for the Holy Spirit to develop us, then we can in turn turn around and pour into somebody else and edify this body as a whole. So just like the adults benefited when they sat there and listened to Jesus as a 12-year-old boy, the whole church grows in vitality when young people are involved. And so this is what I'm praying for. I'm praying for a revival in our church that the Holy Spirit can guide us to focusing on the things that really matter. What I'm praying for is that people can describe this church as their family. And what I'm praying for is that my kid can grow up in a church and a community of belonging that passes the torch of faith to them and that pours and strengthens their belief. You know, as a young youth pastor, um, I remember I, f I was finding it really tough to find someone that I could vent to, that I can seek mentorship from, it's especially as I was learning the ropes and trying to understand the challenges that I was facing. And I thought back to my youth pastor, who I very... Uh, affectionately called Uncle Gary. He, very, um, he was very particular that you called him uncle instead of pastor because it just made that connection more personal. And as a, young, as a young person in my early adolescence, as I would begin to act out, I remember Uncle Gary was that pastor, he was that adult that I could go to knowing that I could get honest and tactful advice without being judged. He also made learning about God fun. He, he, he'd play games with us. He would take us on field trips. He was notorious for spending hundreds of dollars on his own dime feeding us. And as an adult, in my early ministry, Uncle Gary would take us out to dinner all the time. And somehow, you know, they, uh, we would find ourselves in a Denny's. It's not, no one ever goes to Denny's as their first option, you just end up at Denny's. And I remember so many late nights of conversation with Uncle Gary in a booth at, at a Denny's somewhere, because it's the only place that's open 24 hours. 
And we'd be sitting there over a cup of coffee or a bowl of pancake puppies and talking about the finer points of life and where I was in my relationship with God. And never have I had another adult like that would actually, that would actually take the time to pour into me over those meals, breaking bread. And he didn't know it, but there were several times we had those conversations, and they were just late night hangouts, but God would use him to speak into very specific circumstances in my life. And last year we had the privilege of having Uncle Gary be one of the pastors who officiated our wedding, officiated our wedding last year. But we only gave him that opportunity because of the relationship stock that he put in with me and the time that he took to disciple me and invest in my relationship with Jesus. So if you want to influence anyone, especially a young person, you have to build a relationship with them. And my challenge to you, my family, is for you to ask yourself, who are you mentoring? Who are you discipling? Because there's someone that God wants you to pour into and pass that torch of faith onto. Let people know that you care about them. Listen to them. Don't lecture them. And be the physical representation of Jesus in someone's life. That is how we grow warm. Let's pray. Please rise and pray with me. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this body, for this family that meets here under this roof. And as we sit here and think for a moment about the people that you have used instrumentally in our lives as we've grown in Jesus, I just pray that today can be a reminder that our purpose here is not to remain on this planet, but it's to go home. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would dwell here in this place and that it would lead us so that we can be a warm community. A warm community that loves your children and does your work. We thank you for this Sabbath, and we just pray, Lord, that you would help our our thoughts to remain on you, to give us rest in you, and to be ready to be a light to the world in this next coming year. This we pray in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
Yes, he does. 